Once again, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to see all of the networking going on. This is fantastic. I'm sure you're all sharing best practices and promising uh, measures. Uh, but um, we are ready to begin our third panel. Our last panel discussed uh, prevention and protection. And this panel will move to the uh, concepts of identification, investigation, and prosecution. And I am delighted to have as our moderator, Ambassador Kupcina from Belarus. Belarus has been a fantastic partner on combating human trafficking and really uh, a leader, I think, on many issues, particularly uh, combating child exploitation. So we're delighted to have uh, such a, a passionate advocate for this issue here as our moderator. Madam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and dear friends of anti-trafficking. Uh, thank you very much, Val, for, uh, uh, have a, for, for your very kind words addressed uh, uh, to my country and to me personally. Thank you very much. We are really very much committed uh, uh, as UN member states, as the OEC participating as state to a noble course of uh, anti-trafficking in human beings. So, uh, and today I have uh, my honor and my pleasure to welcome all of you at our today's third panel discussion of our conference entitled The Power of Technology to Assist in the Identification of Victims, Investigation of Cases, and Prosecution of Perpetrators uh, of Human Trafficking. The issue of criminal misuse of information and communications technologies to facilitate uh, trafficking in per persons is really a hot topic. As stated in the latest global report on trafficking in persons, the number of human trafficking victims is on the rise, with a clear increase in the numbers of children being trafficked. There is an obvious need to discuss in details, at the international level, the linkages between today's trends in human trafficking and the use of modern technologies. Speaking in my national capacity as ambassador of Belarus, I would like to recall in this regard the resolution preventing and combating trafficking in persons facilitated by the criminal misuse of information and communications technologies, which was proposed by my country and adopted by the United Nations Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice last a year here in Vienna. And actually, it was the first specific international decision in, on this uh, very important topic. But we have not only to speak about this topic with the perspective of establishing a required legal frameworks and partnerships, which is very much important. We also need to discuss concrete solutions and responses. Yesterday, uh, we had an opportunity to learn more about how human traffickers use technology to commit crimes. It is important as to combat something, we need to understand how this something works. Criminal groups turn profit by savvy use of technology to seal illicit deals, and technologies help them to leave little trace behind. It is logical to use here an approach of fighting fire with fire. The 20, 30 years old practices are no longer sufficient to, against criminals who use darknet, who use smartphones, and who use cryptocurrencies. So today we will discuss what technological options are available to improve identification of victims, as well as uh, investigation of human trafficking crimes and bringing traffickers to justice and what considerations we have to be mindful of in this regard. I believe that we also need to discuss the problem of scale and to focus not just on tactical individual tools but rather on strategic interventions. The scalability problem of technology creates a systemic challenge. We have to factor in responses that are scalable at the system level. For example, how do we analyze a, a million of online advertisements at one time looking for the indicators of trafficking? 
We can slow down proliferation of human trafficking by reclaiming the online landscape. For this purpose, we have to add risks into illegal online activities, where currently there is a very small or no risk. One way to do this uh, in the context of law enforcement is through more proactive investigations and undercover operations in the virtual space. Another way is to open a dialogue with private technology developers to communicate on how their projects are being misused. We need uh, responsible development from uh, companies uh, who will do a better job considering the downsides or misuse of their tools. Dear colleagues, dear friends, today we are privileged to have with us um, uh, experts, our panelists, with a very diverse expertise and very extensive experience in human trafficking. Let us listen to them and learn uh, about their promising practices. Uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, our first panelist, first speaker, uh, who is Mick Moran, Garda Liaison Officer at Engarda Shiokana Island. Very good. Uh, Mick Moran joined an Edgarda Shiokana Island's National Police Force in 1990 as a, a uniformed officer in Dublin before moving on to work in various specialized units including drugs and serious uh, crime. He then began to work online in the development of operation capacity in relation to child exploitation on the internet as part of the National Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault team. In 2004, he moved to the Computer Crime Unit at the Garda Bureau uh, of Fraud Investigation, where he worked as a forensic examiner and team leader. In Ju June 2006, he moved to Interpol in Lyon, France, uh, as a criminal intelligence officer specializing in online child exploitation <laughs> cases. In 2013, uh, Mick became assistant director of the Vulnerable Communities Subdirectorate, which includes trafficking in human beings, people smuggling, and child exploitation. Currently, Mick is Garda Liaison Officer in the Irish Embassy in France. Uh, Mick has a Master of Science degree in Forensic Computing and Cybercrime Investigation from University College Dublin and a BA Hans IT from Institute for Public Administration as well as a Diploma in Project management from University College Cork. Uh, he also uh, has a higher diploma in information systems. He is a member of the advisory board of In Hope and We Protect. Mr. Moran will speak about the experience uh, of uh, the authorities of Ireland in the use of technology to identify victims and investigate traffickers and will also reflect on this topic in the context of his experience working for many years for Interpol. You have the floor, sir. Um, <clears throat> after that very long and uh, quite detailed introduction, I want to make it very clear that I am here as, in my capacity as an expert, as distinct from representing Ireland. Uh, Ireland has a uh, mission here to the, uh, um, to the OSCE, and they are present here in the room. If you want to know anything about Ireland, they are the people to speak to. I am here to simply share with you my experience uh, in the international environment as a law enforcement officer working with uh, human trafficking and child exploitation, especially over the last uh, 20 years, really, I've been working in the online environment. Um, if we talk about tools and technology, and I really came here with, with something prepared and I was ready to go, but as I've listened over the last, uh, to the last number of presentations, I have been changing constantly what I wanted to say to you in my head. And the result is I don't have any presentation for you, I don't have any slides because I decided this morning at breakfast that I would abandon everything that I had prepared uh, to share with you a little, a little bit my thoughts um, that have formed over this last 20 years of working especially in the online environment. The question of the use of technology in human trafficking is an interesting one but I think it is very broad and uh, if, if, if this last this couple of days comes up with any solution, I would argue that OSCE must show leadership in defining the problem first. Uh, we've heard many of the speakers here talking about solutions in search of problems. We've heard of 
uh, great ideas turning into great tools that are soon left behind and left on the table. Uh, I heard uh, the ambassador um, from the US yesterday speaking about, or was it, was it Mr. Ritchie speaking yesterday about the, uh, these great computers that are there with access to databases and <clears throat> no connectivity to the internet. Uh, I personally had experience of an operation being delayed for two days because there wasn't enough petrol in a car in Vietnam. Um, these, are, these are real issues. These are real uh, uh, problems when it comes to technology. And defining technology, how do you define technology? We've heard so many uh, different definitions or descriptions of what technology is. I mean, um, the use of facial recognition in passport fraud or driving license fraud is, is, is de rigueur at the moment. And it certainly works in that particular area and in application to particular data sets that somebody has control of. But when you talk about accessing data across borders or accessing data across departments even within government, you, be, you become, things become a lot more complicated, a lot more difficult, and practically impossible a lot of the time. My father had a great expression uh, on the farm that I grew up on. He had a great expression and his expression was, the wonderful works of a wheelbarrow. And later he explained that what he meant by this was that the man whose job it was to move a ton of sand from one end of a yard to another, and all he had was a shovel, thought that the wheelbarrow was wonderful technology. And this is a reality when we deal with human trafficking, when we deal with this gross problem that we deal with <clears throat> at a societal level. An application of technology can mean anything. An application of technology, you know, catching a fish with a spear is one thing, catching it with a rod is another. These are, these are issues that, that we have to understand. Unfortunately, we are living in a world which is being, as the French would say, bouleversé. It's being, being pulled and pushed and changed and, and, and bent out of shape by the information revolution through which we are currently living. The information revolution. We're only starting to understand this information revolution. And if we talk about previous revolutions that humankind has experienced, for example, the, the, the printing press revolution or the industrial revolution, this information revolution is going to leave them in the shade in terms of how it changes humanity. When we talk about the online world and especially the online world of child exploitation, we can see how technology changed it from all of the different perspectives. With an average age, uh, with an average time between child abuse and disclosure of being somewhere around 21 years, and with uh, child abuse material appearing online, actual crime scenes of child abuse appearing online, for the first time ever in humanity, we have the option to disclose on behalf of the child. This is a revolution. But yet we think all the time negatively about child abuse material being online. But yet there's a positive to it as well. Because by having this child abuse material online, it's open and accessible to everybody, including advocates for those children and people who can help to uh, rescue those children and therefore disclose on their behalf that this abuse is taking place and remove them from harm. And this is a very good example of the yin and the yang of technology. It's a very good example of it. Any new technology that you introduce into any area, including trafficking human beings, will have a yin and a yang. And if you want to be successful with the application of this technology to a particular problem, then you must consider deeply the yang and not be out there marketing the yin all the time. It's ultra important. When we talk about technology, in my head, what jumps into it is this information revolution and the internet and the inter information communication technologies that are driving it. And if we talk about their driving it, what are they driving exactly? What are they doing exactly? 
these, this internet, these companies, these huge conglomerates, Amazon, Facebook, Google, what are they doing? Twitter. Are they social networking companies or are they data collection companies? I think the truth, and it's not a negative, the truth is that they are data collection companies and they are collecting massive amounts of information that they are storing and analyzing in a deep manner in order to sell products, in order to do what they do. And this exchange between us, I'm an avid user of the internet and I'm a very big fan of the internet. And I use a lot of Google products because I find that the Google Cloud services, for example, are very useful for me for everything that I do. But in return, Google knows everything that I do. They know everywhere I am. And they can, theoretically, read my messages. So if all this information is there, surely in real terms, traffic in human beings can be dealt with because we know where everybody is. And we know what they're doing. We know who they're writing to. We know who they're reading, what they're reading. But in return for all this data, or in the yang of all this data, is of course that there is protections around the privacy of this data. And so the difficulties in accessing that data, especially from a law enforcement perspective, is in a way ironic. That is changing now, of course, where we can see clearly after the, anal the Cambridge Analytica scandal at Facebook, or we can see the alleged interference in the uh, elections in the US, we can see that things are changing, that the age of self-regulation by these companies is changing, and that they are being made more responsible for content that is on their systems. However, we saw then last week uh, the head of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, coming out and saying that he is going to introduce encryption across the board in all Facebook products. And this will increase the privacy of his users and will encourage people to use his products and to have faith and confidence in the Facebook suite of products. The cynic in me, however, would argue that perhaps by encrypting everything on their systems, they will save an absolute fortune in moderation and they can't be responsible for the content if they can't see the content. And so this has very serious implications in the future for how we deal with all of these issues. But again, I don't want to be negative, talking about the yang of online internet companies, platforms, abdicating responsibility for the content. We can also see that there has been very clear partnership successes in the area of online child exploitation. When I started to use the internet in 1992 or three, you could get access to anything, literally anything online. You still can, but not on the web to which my mother has access. And perhaps this should be flagged as a success that you cannot get child abuse material on the web. You cannot buy access to child abuse material on the web now where you could 10 or 15 years ago. And this has been an enormous success to clear this material off the web through industry, law enforcement, civil society, NGOs like hotlines, in hope, changing user habits. All of these things work together to clear the web. This is an enormous success. Has there been an application of technology there? Certainly, each of those individual uh, groups, civil society, NGOs, uh, hotlines, um, law enforcement, each of them applied technologies that made it useful for them. Industry, who had access to the data, were in, actually in a better position to deal with it, and they did, to be fair to them, uh, using the financial coalition. They, they uh, using the financial coalition, they made sure that none of their products would ever be used for commercial uh, child sexual exploitation online. But one of the key areas that I think is coming out after listening for the last day or so, one of the key things that's coming out is the need for 
proper planning and proper integration of technical solutions for a particular problem. And for that, we really need to concentrate on the application of proper project management principles. The ideas of, um, the ideas of risk management, scope management, user consultation, uh, and most importantly, and I've heard other people saying this, and I'll say it again, and to the academics in the room, I beg you to step forward and shout loudly, evidence-based, evidence-based tools are what is needed. The great idea in the shower on Monday morning that is a product by Friday evening is really no good if you don't have access to data, if you don't have access to uh, um, uh, a genuine case for why it is needed, and certainly do not expect overworked police officers to use your product if you are the one who is creating this product to make their jobs easier, but you have no idea what their jobs is. When we go back to this idea of access to data, we also need to consider privacy again in the sense that in order to tackle trafficking human beings from a criminal perspective, you need to apply the same tools that are used in the investigation of serious crime. We need to acknowledge, certainly we need to acknowledge the prevention aspects of it, we need to acknowledge the protection aspects for victims, but we also need to acknowledge that in order to prosecute trafficking cases, we need to apply, we need to make trafficking a serious crime, and we need to apply the same techniques and policing tools, tool sets, that are also, in a lot of cases, technology. And by this, I'm talking about phone taps, I'm talking about uh, location services, I'm talking about very, very intrusive policing tools. If it is not treated as serious crime, then these tools will never, ever be applied. It's as simple as that. The view that working with women or children uh, within policing is a difficult area is not untrue, but it is also uh, perhaps traditionally within policing seen as soft crime. It's not robberies, it's not uh, murders, it's, you know, soft. And that attitude needs to be changed. And that attitude can be changed through proper training, but also through the encouragement of police services to apply these serious crime tool sets to the problem. Finally, I would just like to sum up by reiterating the point that technology, like my father's wheelbarrow, can be applied at any stage, at any phase in the trafficking process. Recruitment, deception, marketing, coercion, money laundering, money movement, all of these areas are creating data, all of these areas are interesting, but only in our understanding of them. They're interesting only if we have a full understanding of them and proper definition of them. And I would call on uh, OSCE and all of you here in this room from different organizations. I've heard of many of the organizations that I partnered with when I was in uh, Interpol. It's important that we are not, as Evgeny Morozov coined the expression cyber utopians, that we don't see that there is a silver bullet that we can fire and it will solve all of society's issues. That it doesn't exist. What does exist is genuine partnership, genuine consultation, genuine application of the right tools for the right jobs at the right time. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I thank you uh, very much, Mr. Moran, for your very interesting and, I would say, uh, using the word uh, uh, previously used by Val, passionate uh, presentation. With all your experience you gained during the long years serving um, uh, anti-trafficking course, and thank you very much, especially for me, it was very much important to hear the necessity to uh, tackle uh, anti-trafficking uh, trafficking in human beings as a serious crime. 
uh, with the uh, all necessary uh, tool sets and not like a soft crime. Thank you very much. And my uh, next speaker is Elelis Ratam, uh, who is um, a district prosecutor, uh, Northern District Prosecutor's Office, First Department, Drug Related Crime and Organized Crime from Estonia. Elise uh, Ratam uh, has been um, working in different positions in the prosecutor's office of Estonia for five years. For the last years, she as a uh, district prosecutor uh, has been responsible for the human uh, uh, trafficking cases in the Department of Drug-Related Grave and Organized Crime, where she has been successfully uh, prosecuting high-profile cases. She is an enthusiast of the digital uh, criminal proceedings and recently also a member of the working group intending to elaborate best practice for the treatment of victims, intended for law enforcement and other specialists. Uh, Ms. Ratam will speak uh, about the experience of the Estonian authorities in the investigation and prosecution of technology-enabled human trafficking, including the virtual presence of law enforcement, the work on sexual services, web pages, and darknet and mobile devices. You have the floor, madam. Hello, everyone, and um, on behalf of the Estonian Prosecutor's Office, thank you for the invitation. So, as it has already been stressed out many times in the previous uh, presentations, technology is both a blessing and a curse for officials fighting against uh, human trafficking. It's like yin and yang. 90% of all crimes today have a technological or digital component, whether it's planning, commission, or after crime. And tech-savvy perpetrators use technology to facilitate the crimes for grooming, for recruitment, logistics, planning, and advertising of the victims, but also to take advantage of the anonymization and encryption tools to cover their actions. The perceived anonymity and mass audience of online services increases both discretion as well as profitability of these services, making it challenging to identify criminals by using traditional police techniques. Moreover, everything that has been disclosed online can be changed and deleted fast. On the other hand, we know that enforcement operations are usually reactive, not proactive. And therefore, it is evident that in order to be successful in these criminal investigations, law enforcement has to be creative and to combine and adapt classical investigation techniques. In Estonia, a special unit was formed in the criminal police in 2003 to fight against prostitution in a targeted way. Since 2005, the main focus went from the streets to the World Wide Web. The idea was, and is still today, that technology can also be used as an asset to identify more victims and perpetrators and to turn conspiracy methods and tactics that criminals use against them by collecting even better evidence to represent in the court via information and communication technologies. As a result, most of the criminal cases are proactive today and initiated by the police based on the information that has been collected by themselves with operating monitoring of the internet. So how does it work in practice? Actually, it is quite simple. For us, virtual presence of the authorities means that there are several investigators whose daily job is to analyze the information. Criminals who are engaged in trafficking of human beings are driven by the financial gain, so they need a place to sell, a marketplace. In Estonia, we have identified the main channels where this is taking place, and usually these are the web pages dedicated to offer sexual services or employment mediation. What our law enforcement has been initiating is to have a conversation and mutual understanding with the owners of those web pages, to raise the awareness of the problem they might be a part of, and also to steer them to cooperation. <coughs> and gradually, there has been a success, as they are providing us with an information that is vital for detecting the victims and perpetrators, like IP and DNS addresses and mobile phone numbers used to activate the account, and at the advertisement. 
Therefore, from the web page itself, we are able to see a little more than it would be possible with open source intelligence tools. But it is also important to stress out that at this space, none of the information is identifiable with an actual person. So these are all nicknames in here, and we actually don't know who is the user behind those accounts. So what happens next is that we are using link cluster analysis program to convert those non-personalized ads into the basic Microsoft Excel file. And what we are looking for here are the patterns. For example, we can sort the worksheet um, by the telephone numbers used to activate the ad. Uh, but this itself does not give us enough information about possible human trafficking case. So the next step would be to link this data together with the help of IBM i2 notebook program, which enables us to get a more comprehensive overview. So, yeah. We call this graph uh, dragon, and what interests us the most in here is its head, which you can see on the left and which is now in the center. Um, where connections between data uh, provided and analyzed are the tensest. So the, the head of the dragon is really what the law enforcement should focus. And so from here we can see that several ads have been added from the same IP addresses or mobile phone number and can by the metadata be linked to each other. It is like a small ecosystem where you can identify by the connections who is probably who, uh, the possible mediator, dispatcher, and also the victim. And after this process, the official will check the advertisement uploaded. Uh, uh, uploaded. So we will seek whether the uh, advertisements were added at the same time. Are there similarities in the pictures or linguistics? Um, what kind of feedback do the clients provide? Do they mark that the possible victim is someone from a different ethnic or race group or is speaking foreign or only limited sexual language? Or did they seem to be abused substances or have any health issues? Then finally, only if the impression provided by the analysis in, is confirmed, personification of the particular subjects will be initiated. And of course, starting from this investigation phase, motivated order from the prosecutor is mandatory to gain information from the telecommunication companies. Um, undoubtedly, this method helps us to target our resources better and to enhance the effectiveness and also to guarantee that we are addressing the root of the possible trafficking crime, not only single actors. Uh, another topic where the online presence of the law enforcement is inevitable is grooming of children for the sexual exploitation. As modi operandi of those criminals is usually unique. For example, the victim selection, trust development, establishing a relationship and maintaining control is predominantly made via social media, our investigation methods are also different. Usually we obtain the court order to carry out the sting operation on, on a specific website, but due to the strict legal framework and court practice, uh, the general rule is that the police agent never initiates the contact first or directs the conversation to avoid the provocation. And after the conversation constitutes enough evidence about the crime, non-content data is requested um, from the web page to identify the criminal. Although we have never had any trouble while obtaining the information asked, due to the internal regulations of the companies, they are closing the accounts of the perpetrators immediately, which means that identifying the real victim is burdensome. And uh, actually, we are not able to uh, prosecute uh, a suspect uh, for the finished crime, but only for the impossible attempt of the crime. Moreover, as at one point, most of the perpetrators are interested of photos or video calls. The commission of this technique raises both ethical and uh, legal questions, as we cannot and should not reproduce the content. 
So in the future, we might need a computer-generated child to catch online predators. Uh, <clears throat> the Estonian law enforcement is keeping an eye on a dark web also, but fortunately, none of the human trafficking cases hasn't, has been initiated uh, so far from this platform. The idea that we have been trying to practice in relation to this platform is that whenever we detain a criminal having committed a crime in a dark web, we try to confiscate their accounts to use it in other investigations. The value of this step uh, lies in the fact that law enforcement also needs to have a profile which seems trustworthy for the criminals. So possibility to use an account which has been activated long time ago, has its order history and feedback can be exceptionally beneficial for the law enforcement. And the power of technology is also topical after the victims have been identified and perpetrators have been caught. Mobile devices like smartphones and tablets contain <coughs> personal information, ma mission, such as call history, text messages, emails, digital photographs, videos, address books, calendars, web browser information, passwords, and sometimes even credit card numbers making some experts refer to them even like a new kind of eyewitnesses, as this can be useful as a source of digital evidence to be examined. Although we usually involve digital forensics to guarantee the integrity of the valuable evidence and to document the chain of the custody to make sure that the evidence would be admissible in the court, most of the devices and applications support encryption or biometric lock that could make data inaccessible to the law enforcement. In addition, from the legal standpoint, there is a delicate line between an inspection and a search of the device. And for example, in a situation where some of the information is located on a cloud service, evidence can be spread around the world, which requires uh, the ability to justify extraterritorial search and jurisdiction from the prosecution. This means, essentially, that both law enforcement capacity and methods and our national and international legislation and legal frameworks need constant development to be able to fight the phenomena of modern slavery in a digital age more comprehensively. <coughs> and I would like to finish my presentation with a thought that me and my colleague shared last week and what we can see from the law enforcement perspective is something that is trending. That Human trafficking does not mean these days at all that someone is abused in a physical or even emotional sense, that the victim does not have documents or does not get any salary. It might also appear, as mentioned already yesterday um, by the uh, presentation by Ms. Anna Revenko, that criminals are just using legal loopholes, the so-called gray areas, while formerly everything is correct and legal, but then again, if we compare the situation of the victim to the person who is carrying out the same activities without being a victim, then we can see a grave injustice. Therefore, it is important to see a bigger picture, but also to look at the each and every case individually, especially from the law enforcement perspective, as it might be that law enforcement is the first to approach the victim and all the investigation should and will be uh, victim-based. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ratton, for sharing with us a very interesting experience of the Estonian authorities uh, uh, in combating uh, trafficking in persons. Uh, and also thank you uh, very much uh, for your last point that all investigation in, of these cases should be victim-based. Thank you. Uh, my um, uh, next speaker uh, uh, is Ms. Um, uh, Bria King. Ms. Bria King. Ms. King heads uh, the strategy for Spotlight, Torrance product that uh, helps law enforcement identify child uh, uh, victims of trafficking. By working closely with law enforcement and tech partners, um, um, 
we are able to introduce state-of-the-art yet uh, approachable technology with the goal of increasing investigative workflow efficiency and ultimately to ensure quicker identification of high-risk children. She has been in technology for nearly a decade and spends her spare time volunteering with a local organization to raise awareness of sex trafficking in her hometown of Portland, Oregon, in the United uh, States. And Ms. King will be speaking about the work of this NGO, TORN, uh, the technology product that this NGO has developed to fight human trafficking, the impact of their work, and what made TORN successful, and how their model could be replicated in the other parts of the OSC area. You have the floor, madam. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, and thank you to the OSCE for bringing Thorne here to speak to you all about the technology that we've developed in order to fight child sex trafficking. I want to start with a little background on Thorne and our organization and how it came about. Back in 2012, our co-founders had watched a documentary on child sex trafficking in Cambodia. They describe how they felt after this moment as a time when you learn something about the world that you can't unsee. And so from here is really what kicked off their research in terms of child sex trafficking in the United States. What they found was that the issue was just as prolific in the United States as it was in other countries around the world. What's more is that these children were being bought and sold online in the open web next to sections where cars were being bought and sold. So while technology didn't create this issue, it democratized it. And we believed that there in, in within the technology was also a solution. It's from this realization that Thorn was created at Thorne, our mission is to drive technical innovation to fight child sex trafficking and child sexual exploitation. Our work is guided by three principles. We're a nonprofit that sits at the intersection of technology companies, um, NGOs, anti-trafficking organizations, survivor organizations, and law enforcement to combat child sexual trafficking and exploitation through victim identification and support, deterring predatory behavior, and making platforms hostile for abuse. We leverage the digital footprints of child abuse to find victims faster and to stop potential further abuse. I will spend a little bit of time speaking with you all about some of the technology that we've developed on our end, but a lot of that would be remiss without explaining and really backing up in terms of how we went about developing our tools. It's been brought up several times throughout each of these panels that you need to have a need and a problem to solve before you're able to apply techno technological solutions towards that. So the most critical piece to development of the tool that I'm about to explain to you all was understanding the sex trafficking landscape in the United States. First and foremost, many of you may already be aware of some of these questions that I'm about to pose to you, but in doing the research, the most important thing for us to understand was who the victims were. Who were the most vulnerable communities that were experiencing child sex trafficking? And what we came to find is that child welfare programs tended to be um, some of the most at-risk children for sex trafficking, those in foster care, those who experienced homelessness. And while we don't have a significant amount of domestic data around it, we do know that refugee and migrant communities are also at risk. In our research, we also wanted to understand what victim support services were available if a victim chose to get out of the life once they were actually recovered by law enforcement. Again, it would be remiss if we had a tool that provided law enforcement with the ability to identify victims faster if we did not have the appropriate support services in place for the victims. And finally, whether there were any penalties for victims, such as deportation, which is an important consideration. We also needed to understand the sex trafficking landscape. Was it digital in nature, and how did it manifest itself? This was a big question in terms of being able to identify if technology could even be used to uh, leverage the fight against sex trafficking. 
We also needed to understand if there was government vested interest in the fight against sex trafficking. What did the legislation look like to not only prosecute traffickers, but to protect the victims? And are there any legal restrictions associated to um, the type of data that we would want to collect in order to prosecute those traffickers? And finally, this has also been brought up, but understanding the issue from the front lines. Who's investigating these types of cases? What challenges are they running into? And how do they work across jurisdictions and across borders? What we find in the United States is that the majority of victims are being trafficked domestically from state to state, not necessarily from country to country, but it makes it just as critical to ensure that those individuals are collaborating with each other, whether it is country to country or state by state. We took it a level deeper and we wanted to uh, do additional research in terms of what I mentioned related to survivors and also with law enforcement. We found that there were over 200,000 escort ads being posted on a daily basis in the United States. Somewhere in that pile of data, of course, we knew were unfortunately children who were being bought and sold for sex. We conducted a uh, survivor study and reached out to individuals to understand more about their situations. What we came to find is that underage victims had clearly said that they were bought or sold online. As a matter of fact, 75% said that they were advertising online. And of those victims, many said that there was some indication within their ad that they were underage. So we heard yesterday about some of the themes that you see throughout the escort ads that are either indicative of trafficking, or in this case, indicative of someone who is a child who's underage. We also wanted to understand this issue further from law enforcement. So we conducted several law enforcement interviews. As Mick had mentioned, you really need to understand how individuals are investigating this work and how they're doing that job. We knew that there was law enforcement dedicated to investigating sex trafficking in the United States, um, but we needed to know more. And what we found was that they just didn't have enough time to look into the 200,000 ads that were being posted on a daily basis to find within that pile of data who the at-risk victims were. Additionally, what we found was that online evidence was disappearing at the drop of a hat. So exploiters would essentially post an ad only to take it down within days or hours and post a new one with additional information, such as a new phone number, as a way to evade law enforcement. So what I want to talk to you about today, uh, I'll cover some high level on our tool spotlight. What these challenges that I mentioned ultimately added up to was that this was a technical technology problem and a data problem. Through technology, we believed that we could come up with a solution that would help law enforcement identify victims faster. So we launched our tool spotlight in the US in October of 2014 and in Canada in December of 2016. It's a web-based application that we provide to law enforcement that ultimately provides them with the intelligence and leads around suspected victims of trafficking so that they can identify those victims faster. I want to speak to you about two specific challenges that we addressed and how we address them from a, a technological standpoint. One is that online evidence was disappearing. So we knew that we needed to collect data at scale from the most prolific online sexual advertisement sources and ultimately allow law enforcement to easily search on that data. We also knew that there was a massive amount of data that existed, 200,000 daily ads where we needed to assist law enforcement in identifying who the most high risk victims were. In our research, we took 100 known ads of underage victims to understand the patterns of how someone who is underage may write their own ad or how someone was trafficked might write their own ad. And so on top of that data that we've collected, not only did we need to make it accessible, archive that data, and allow law enforcement to search on it, we needed to apply intelligence on top of that that allowed them to narrow that data further through using natural language processing and artificial intelligence. 
Just to share some statistics I pulled this week, in the last week alone, there have been 28,000 ads that were posted in New York City. 1,900 of those have been indicated as underage victims by our underage model, which cuts back the amount of time that law enforcement needs to sift through that data significantly. So some applicable things to everyone in the room in terms of what's made us successful and how you can really understand how technology may be applied is the research. I will go back to that in terms of understanding how trafficking is manifesting itself in your country in particular. Is it digital in nature? And then also understanding the issue from survivors and from law enforcement. We also couldn't do this alone. Um, our partnerships have been one of the strongest assets across law enforcement, NGOs, survivor groups, and tech companies. As a nonprofit ourselves, building these relationships have been critical to building our cr credibility and ultimately supporting our work. We also know that victims come into contact with other industries. So we've been leveraging our data through our partnerships to understand where victims may be intersecting with other industries, such as healthcare or even on social media platforms, which we know are being used for recruitment and grooming. And finally, this is technology is something that needs to constantly be adapting. Um, as technology changes, we know that the crime does as well. Traffickers continue to find new ways to exploit their victims, and we also know that in the United States, sex trafficking has gained some attention from the U.S. government. So as such, our tool has had to adapt with the changes. FOSTA SESTA was mentioned yesterday, and as a result, shut down one of the most prolific sources, Backpage.com, and what ended up that ended up resulting in ultimately a spread of additional sources that came up as they competed to be back page replacement. We've since started collecting from seven additional sources that have arisen since that shutdown and will continue to do so. Um, what we've seen is that there's not necessarily a back page replacement, but rather regional specificity depending or preferences to that source. So it's popular in the southeast of the United States, may not be the same that's popular in the Northwest. We've also recently released facial recognition. So it's critical for us to make sure that law enforcement has the ability to identify children faster. When, some, when a child goes missing, they're able to either input that image into Spotlight and determine if there are any matches, or they're also able to take an image that's within the application and run facial recognition on that to identify additional intelligence or information related to that victim. So even if their images change over time, we're still able to maintain that digital footprint of where that victim is and what their trafficking situation is. To date, Spotlight uh, is used by over 9,000 law enforcement officers across the US and Canada at federal, state, and local levels. We've helped to identify almost 32,000 victims, about 9,000 of which were children, and over 10,000 perpetrators or traffickers over the last three years. We haven't gone further internationally quite yet, I'm, as I imagine that as a question from many folks, because we, we want to make sure that we have the right government and law enforcement buy-in. We also need to understand, as I've mentioned, how sex trafficking manifests itself in other organizations and other countries. We're looking into that as a possibility in the future, but as has been mentioned many times, there's no silver bullet and there is not a one size fits all solution. So our goal going forward would be to continue to leverage that research as we potentially explore international expansion. Some additional considerations that I wanna call out. Uh, one is that we know that this space is very much underfunded, and while it can be very daunting to fund large-scale tech investments, we know that the enormity of technological challenges in child protection require equivalent technological responses. So investment in tech tools in this space is critical where possible. Data sharing across government and law enforcement entities and particularly across borders and jurisdictions is also critical in being able to maintain and understand the footprint of victims and where they're being exploited. 
And also ensuring that uh, this was mentioned yesterday as well, involving local law enforcement and survivor advocates when considering legislation and policy around this issue. Uh, so as I mentioned with the shutdown of Backpage, that these are things that uh, absolutely need to be considered when visiting that legislation and going back to law enforcement and survivors. Related to government and legislation, I'm going to pivot for a moment on um, something specifically that is key to Thorne's mission, as been mentioned by some other panel members, and that's eliminating child sexual abuse material from the internet. Under that scope, we've been closely following the EU draft e-privacy regulation, which I know affects several members here in the OSCE region. We support a very specific carve-out that would allow companies to proactively scan for and remove child sexual abuse material from the internet while still maintaining GDPR and e-privacy protections. I can't uh, explain enough how important allowing this proactive and voluntary work to continue is essential to eliminating child sexual abuse material from the internet. And we are hopeful that the final draft uh, will include this carve out as well as a commitment that's applied across borders and not just state by state. So in solution here, I do want to wrap up um, with a couple of action items as mentioned before. You know, of course, being here is the first step, and I encourage everyone uh, to understand the problem uh, before developing the solutions as been, has been brought up. Listen to and learn from survivors and law enforcement. Invest in tech, and finally, be an advocate for prioritizing tackling sex trafficking through government buy-in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. King, for your very inspiring presentation, sharing with us the uh, practices made by your NGO, Torna, uh, uh, who has developed these new technology products. Uh, the strategy spotlight uh, being used in the uh, um, uh, United States and Canada. Uh, and thank you very much also for uh, emphasizing the necessity uh, of these partnerships. Partnerships is one of the uh, most important ele ele elements of the success story you created uh, with your NGO. Thank you very much. My uh, next speaker, um, Ms. Henny Verbeek Custers, who is chair of the Egmont Group of Financial Intelligence Unit, Unit's Commissioner uh, of the Liechtenstein Initiative for a Financial Sector Commission on Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking, uh, who will be speaking about the opportunities that the states may have by looking into the financial component of human trafficking and about the value of analyzing big data related to banking and financial transactions. She will provide examples of successful projects and suggest recommendations for use of technology in financial and banking uh, uh, data analysis. You have the floor, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, as has been uh, mentioned a lot, and probably also in the, in the last session it will be mentioned, is that there is no such thing as a silver bullet. So what I will do now is add a piece of the puzzle that may help us in understand and work to a comprehensive method of fighting and combat human trafficking, modern slavery. Um, Besides the, the two positions that were already mentioned by our moderator, chair of the Egmont Group of FIUs, and also a commissioner of the Financial Sector Commission, the Liechtenstein Initiative, I'm also the head of the FIU of the Netherlands. And it's uh, also based on that experience that I will share with you how financial in intelligence can be of use in the fight against human trafficking. Since human trafficking is a crime, and if there's a crime, it's about money. And if it's about human trafficking, it's about big money. Organized crime groups are involved, and it's our task to prevent victims being made, to save victims, but also to fight the criminals who commit these acts. And um, financial intelligence can be of big use in both. 
What we have learned in the Netherlands FIU is that we see a difference between uh, financial behavior of victims of um, labor exploitation and victims of sexual exploitation. And what is good for you all to know that in each country that you represent here around the table, there is a financial intelligence unit. In each country that is represented here, there is a big part of the civil society, all the financial institutions, who have an obligation to report to that financial intelligence unit any suspicious transaction that can be related to money laundering, terrorism financing, or any of the predicate offenses of money laundering. I think my microphone doesn't work. Should you switch it? it okay. It, it, it's oh. good. Okay, it's good. Um, and that means that these financial intelligence units, they have a partnership with a, an important part of the civil society and through the Egmont Group of Financial Intelligence Units, they also have an international partnership. The objectives of the use of financial intelligence in the Netherlands is to produce it to detect and investigate cases of human trafficking and to support prosecution of traffickers. Um, the technology that I am talking about is mainly the handling and processing of a growing amount of data. The approach of the FAU the Netherlands is really not rocket science, but it has been mentioned earlier here. Keep it simple. It should be doable and understandable. And what we start from is understand the crime. As Bria, you just explained, you have to understand how it works, how it functions, who is playing what role, in order to be able to know where to tackle it. So we study lit literature, publications, and we study any investigation that we can lay our hands on, on human trafficking and sexual exploitation. My analysts also talk to victims to understand how their situation was. And then we develop hypothesis on the potential financial angle of the crime, both if it comes to how can we detect victims through financial behavior, but also how can we detect perpetrators. And to give you an example, in the Financial Sector Commission, two survivors are commissioners, and one of them also told us it's not only about the transactions that a victim does, but it's also about the transactions she doesn't do. If in the monitoring of a bank they have indicators that one of their clients might be a victim of sexual exploitation, her message was if she never purchases anything in a pharmacy or a clothing shop, that's particular behavior. This might be an indication that there's no freedom to move. Those are very relevant indicators that can be shared with banks. After we have developed these hypotheses, we translate them into queries. Well, not, I don't do that. Luckily, we have very experienced analysts in the FIU who so do that. And we identify what data are needed, besides the data we have in our own databases. And here we encounter sometimes difficulties. Because one time, for an experiment, we have been allowed to make use of the data of our immigration service. Because according to our hypothesis, there would be useful information in there. And it turned out to be true, but legally spoken. And because of uh, privacy requirements, these are not data that we are entitled to use always. We analyzed the results of the queries and we conclude and amend the hypothesis where needed, so it becomes stronger. And then the cooperation starts. Because based on the outcome of the analysis of what comes out of the queries, specific cooperation is initiated with the relevant sectors. 
And what have we done? We have shared red flags and typologies with the reporting entities. That's what we call the civil society part who is required to report. And information of use has been given to law enforcement because we were better able to detect what transactions, what financial transactions could actually lead to cases of human trafficking. We activate network partners in using and acquiring financial intelligence because it may be evident, also because of listening of all the presentations you have heard the last couple of days, that it is not self-evident for law enforcement working on human trafficking to work on a financial investigation. And more and more we have learned that this can be of very good use. And we have started to do joint analysis with other FIUs. This goes beyond exchanging information. This is identifying that we have sets of data that we should analyze jointly. Because by doing so, we can really step up our cooperation and the analysis and the results that come from that. And what we have seen over the years is that once we have shared these red flags and typologies with the financial sector, that the reports they sent to us have grown in quantity but also in quality. And then to give you an idea on what is it then that we look, that we look at in our queries. We have what we call the so-called non-financial characteristics and from the uh, position of the Netherlands. We look at specific nationalities that we have learned, that we have identified in the cases that law enforcement has uh, conducted in the Netherlands. So we look at the nationalities of Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Nigeria, and most recently also Albania, Moldova, and Ukraine. These are countries of origin, but also known hubs. And we have learned to distinguish between source countries, transit countries, and destination countries, because that means that you have different sets of financial behavior. And then we come to the financial characteristics. Um, we see very often that um, victims of sexual exploitations do money transfers towards their country of origin. And the money transfer offices more and more are capable of identifying a victim and making a report. It has very often to do with a high frequency of money transfer in order to stay below the level of, of where a report has to be made. And it is very helpful, the transaction description, because we see that the, the, the reporters now, uh, for instance, mention she was having a note in her hands, there was a man waiting outside for her, etc., etc. This type of behavior has helped us to identify victims. And this query looks at persons, for instance, who did a money transfer very recently to the country of origin. Operational methods thus far. Um, our queries are mainly based on the money transfers because they are very often linked to victims. It has proven to be a very successful way to identify victims. Based on the transaction description of the reporting entities, and as mentioned earlier, this is work in progress on the bank transactions because here we believe there must be hidden information on the perpetrators because that's where we expect the big money to be a, that we can detect. And as mentioned earlier, these are all institutions who want to work with us, who do work with us. And it may not have escaped to your attention that the banks in Europe are under scrutiny and that there's a lot of pressure on them to be very precise in their customer due diligence in know your customer and then in reporting the unusual or suspicious transactions. So we see a lot of willingness with the banks to work with us here to be ordered to better detect the transactions in their databases 
that might refer to human trafficking. And what we also do, of course, is what we call reactive matching. Once we know victims, once we know perpetrators from the police investigations, we try to identify whether we can retrieve financial information. And we have an opportunity, it is called Match 3, which is anonymized matching with other FIUs, meaning that we anonymize all the names of the perpetrators and the victims and we match them with the databases of other FIUs to identify if we can get even a more elaborated picture on the financial behavior of both that can lead to more organized crime groups as well. And um, well, this, is, this must be a familiar picture to you now, but what, it's, what it shows here is in the, these are analysis of police investigations in the Netherlands of, in first instance, similarly um, crime groups who are isolated and cooperating um, apart from one another. Our analysis has proven that there is a financial connection between the crime groups. And this leads to the assumption that there is a financial logistical network enabling several groups to launder their money and to be able to help the perpetrators to stay out of the reach of law enforcement. So what is for us the way forward in querying? Um, analyzing further on hits. This has to do with persons, individuals, subjects, on characteristics of transactions, and on characteristic, characteristics of transaction patterns. And here we do need more international cooperation because these patterns are never just domestically. Further cooperation with reporting entities to improve the ways of reporting. And as mentioned, they're very, very open to this, this way of cooperating in order for us to find new ways to uncover human trafficking. And yes, we do have challenges for the future. As mentioned, we have identified that the joint analysis we conducted with other EU FAUs have revealed very, very important identification of groups. But right now we have to do a lot of manual uh, processing of large uh, data and we would need IT tooling for this kind of joint analysis. Um, we believe that artificial intelligence can actually help us to process large databases to do it more rapidly. And IT tools should be available for all FIUs. Um, well, Mick has mentioned the lack of, of gas in a car in Vietnam to be able to move forward. I would the FIU in Vietnam also to have the sufficient IT tooling to be able to work with the other FIUs around the world to create this network. Follow the money. Does it help? Only. I believe only if we can start cooperate with the destination countries FIUs, meaning big amounts of money go around in um, human trafficking. To give you an idea, I, I got these figures yesterday evening from one of my analysts. He said you, sh you should tell them. In the years 17, 18 and the first months of 19, the disseminated information of the FIU the Netherlands, transactions that clearly have a connection with human trafficking go to the amount of 100 million euros. That's only the Netherlands. So there's really a lot of money going on. But we must find a way to cooperate with the FIUs in the country where this money lands. And our dilemmas, as mentioned, access to relevant databases. We believe we could even detect more and more important liaisons if we could have access to more databases. And as mentioned earlier, earlier, we do have the technical possibilities 
and we do also have legal impediments. And I believe this is something that can be discussed here at OSCE. Where stops privacy, where begins privacy, as with regards to what can law enforcement do. Thank you. I thank you very much, Ms. Verbeek Casters, for this very interesting pre uh, presentation, uh, highlighting the role of financial intelligence uh, in uh, countering human trafficking, um, uh, based upon the experience of the Netherlands uh, Financial Intelligence Unit, headed by you, actually, and also uh, uh, highlighting the importance of joint work within the EU, but with, with other FIU colleagues throughout the world. Thank you so much. And uh, we have... I'm sorry. <laughs> so shall I repeat it once yeah, again? Yes. So <laughs> I'm sorry. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Verbe Casters, for your very interesting presentation highlighting the role of financial intelligence in countering human trafficking, uh, based upon uh, the uh, experience of the Netherlands um, Financial Intelligence Unit. And thank you for emphasizing the, the uh, importance of joint work uh, with other EU colleagues um, and also with the FIU colleagues um, uh, internationally. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Cécile Plessard, who is sociologist, um, IAE Kayen University, Cayenne, Normandy. Cécile Plessard is a researcher in soci sociology and teaches sociology and methods in the University, Cayenne, Normandy. She is specialized in social network analysis. Together with um, Benedict Lavaux Legendre, researcher in law from um, Com 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 Contrasec, sorry, <laughs> University of Bordeaux. Uh, she has been working on trafficking in human beings for the last five years and applying the network approach on criminal groups involved in the phenomenon. Uh, Ms. Plessard uh, will speak about software called uh, Avres, which performs the analysis and visualization of criminal networks. She will describe uh, what uh, this technology tool uh, allows uh, to perform. It uh, by and limitations and its practical impact. You have the floor, madam. Thanks. <laughs> so since three years, uh, Benedict Lavolojean, researcher in law, and I, researcher in sociology, are working on a research methodology able to grasp how human trafficking works. And we want to thank OSCE <laughs> for giving us the opportunity to present our work. Today, I will expose a methodology based on the case of sexual exploitation of Nigerian girls and women in France, and how does the technology we use can contribute to the effort to end human trafficking. No, doesn't work. Okay. Our main question is how does human trafficking work? We try as researchers to keep in mind what do the practitioners need to have in order to better understand how human trafficking works. Despite the fact that the tool and the project is still on the academic level, we mixed the big sociological question, the social organization of the group, and the practitioners one, pointing the criminally reprehensible reprehensible task and those that can escape prosecution. So from an academic perspective, we want to improve the knowledge, but we also want to assist with our work the judicial decision. For this work, we are working on court file data with final judgment for human trafficking, and we are analyzing the phone intercepts, documents, and audition. So, this is the details of all of our project. So Avres, analyzing and visualization of criminal network, is our first project and also the first step in the development of the methodology will include the building of an IT tool. The code file data are really rich and complex, so we needed a tool able to collect, organize, and visualize all the data. And we just start a new project Minexp and are about to start a second one, Trafor. In both, we will apply the same methodology within the same tool. 
So the aim of the global project is to be generic in order to compare different forms of exploitation and country origin and see if there is if there are regularities in the modus operandi or rather different patterns depending to the nature, the, the context, and so on. So our methodology is based on a global approach. Depending on the study and the type of data you have, you can say that human trafficking is based on criminal role, a, ch a chain of tasks involved in development of the criminal uh, activities, here you will ask the question, who does what? You can also analyze the factor of vulnerability, motivation, and individual context of each victim and perpetrators, and you will, you will ask, who are they? But they are both based on an individual approach. You can also have a more structural and macro perspective in paying attention on the link between the people and also the environment they are attached with. Our approach is to analyze these four levels, one by one, and after combine them to have a complete picture of the modus operandi of the human trafficking and the statue of each actor are their real position in the system. We need to have this information to better understand all the dimensions and the resources of the criminal activity. From the code file data, with the final judgment of human trafficking, we are analyzing the phone intercepts document audition and in some research, we can also add interviews and qualitative analyses of the contents. I won't focus my speech further on the theoretical or methodological point of view. We can discuss it later if you want. But I will expose shortly what the tool allows and how it is different from the existing similar tools. No. <laughs> so first, the tool allows to collect all the data in the same space. We first tried on the Excel sheets, but it was not uh, enough flexible and stable in the, f in the same times uh, to put all the data all together. So we built uh, our old tool based on Neo4G technology. And so we can collect in the same place individual characteristics, criminal roles, links between the actors, and all the nature of the links, kinship, romantic and sexual relationships, roommates and hosts, financial flows, criminal activity, and acquaintance. And we can also uh, collect the action who gives the nature of these links. So the tool allows also to analyze this data. Some descriptive analyses are in the tool himself, but we can also create an export files with all the data or a specific scale based on query and visualization. And from this export, we do factorial analysis on roles in order to test who does what. And we do a social network analysis in order to see with whom they are connected. We also do advanced network analysis who allow, allows to analyze the statistic and the network information all together in order to know if the interactions are linked to their roles, their gender, nationality, and so on. We can also test if some links, as kinship, kinship for example, can explain the links between the criminal activities. And the tool all allows also to visualize the network. With a network approach, we show the structure and the group based on interaction. You show the chain of tasks and actors' connection within the groups. This is a way to explore the logic beyond the social organization of the THB practice. Here, you don't focus anymore on the social factor and attributes or on the individual motivation. You focus on the links. The sociological explaining is among the links. There is different way to do social network analysis, and we try to do all of them. The first one is the one mode network, so you focus on actors, links with actors. You can do full networks or personal networks. This is a picture of the full networks of 314 40, 14 actors of uh, sexual exploitation, and uh, you can see that there is, there is different type of links. You can also focus on ego networks, so you focus on one actor and you see which womb this actor is connected. The tools also 
allows to do two mode networks, which means that you will focus not anymore on actors connecting with actors, but actors with non-actors, objects, events, affiliation. So here you can see a picture of the people, in actors in green, who are connected with place of prostitution. So it's also another way to see the organization and the structure of the network. We can also do in the same, uh, in the same picture the one mode and the two mode uh, affiliation. You can also see what we call multiplicity of the links, which means that the two actors can be links with different times in the same time. That means that, for instance, you can have financial uh, links between two people, but also in the same time they live in the same place and maybe they are from the same family. So the multiplicity of the links uh, shows the complexity of the networks and also the difficulty for victims to exit. Okay, so here you have four pictures because the tool allows to have four panels in the same times with different queries uh, each time. So in the first uh, uh, picture on the right, you have the full networks. If you go down, you have only the financial links from the same actors. On the right, the kinships, because there is a lot of family groups within the networks. And if you go up, you have the criminal action. And you can do inf a lot of queries based on hypotheses we do, <laughs> for sure, and also another one. Here, for instance, we focus on the action prostitute for. So the link are A, prostitute for B. And you can see with the red arrows that people, some, some people are both prostitute and peep, pimps in the same times. There is bias and limit of the tool. One of the biggest one is that the data we have, the court file data we have, are not scientist data, they are investigation data. So the purpose is for investigation, so the data are not homogenic, they don't ask the same question to all the people. Also they focus on some people and uh, from a research point of view we will focus on all the people in the same time, so the focus is not the same. There is also a lot of uh, unreliable data, wrong identity, false paper, a lot of alias. Some alias can be used by 10, 15, 20 people in the same time, so it's difficult to connect the people. There is also the cultural elements, specifically with the Nigerian one, blood ties, family links, call someone sister or cousin is not the same in the French context, so we also have to think about that. And this is also not a criminal network. The boundaries are not the network, it's the court files. And the court files focus on specific actors. So it's more aggregation of personal networks that we add than a full networks. And also this is a method uh, who uh, costs a lot of time. If I go on the practical impact of the tool, yeah, my, my last slides. The practical impact of the tool, uh, we want, so it's, it's also an ongoing project, at least uh, this, uh, this part. And the whole methodology with the global approach can help to better, understand the, to better understand the phenomenon of human trafficking. The tool and the result of the analysis can be a prosecution support in showing the structures, the strength of the group and the roles of the actors. It could be used in the court, for instance. We, we have a discussion with the prosecutor about that. He said, well, it could be good to have it during the court to show the complexity of the groups and to, to see the embeddedness of the actors in different slides of the, the links. We also start to discuss with the Ministry of Justice in France about uh, developing and add uh, one interface for practitioner. It will be just a new slide on the existing tool. And the idea behind is that police officer will input the data in real time during the investigation. So they will be able to visualize the data, the new data, and cross them with the former treatment we did of from our uh, court database. So it can give hypotheses and tracks for the investigation if the next networks are similar to uh, uh, networks we already uh, analyzed. 
The tool is also able to link information about individuals from one court file to another, and there is people that we find in different court files, so you can enlarge the network uh, you have. And uh, you can also see the, you can also identify the people who are what we call central in the network. I will just see you a last picture to show uh, when we do network, social network analysis on the data. So the red is the people who were investigated. The square is, uh, more the square is big, more the centrality is uh, important. Means they are connected with more people than the other. And you can see that in blue, there is people with big scares, so they are important. Yeah. I'm very much sorry. Uh, uh, we will continue in one moment. I would like, uh, distinguished colleagues, with your permission to release interpreters as we are running out of time, and we will continue for five minutes uh, with our uh, uh, today's panel. Okay. So, interpreters, thank you so much. Please. Yeah, okay. So, you can see that there is blue square. Uh, we were not under investigation, but still central in the network because they are connecting uh, with a lot of people. In the big blue one, we know that the people were investing in on it, but it was a branch in Paris, and the time of the on, on the investigation was too big, uh, so they cut it and bring this one on the court. Thank you. <laughs> I thank you very much, Ms. Plessard, for this very interesting presentation from a researcher point of view. Um, it was very much interesting and also uh, uh, sorry for inconvenience because we, we are really uh, on a very interesting topic and it uh, took a little bit more time than we planned. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, uh, now we uh, finalized all five presentations, uh, but uh, we are running out of time, as you understand. We already released interpreters, and we have quite a long list of speakers from the floor. So my proposal would be to continue with the, uh, with the statements, which we do already have, uh, during the next session, uh, panel four. Uh, so um, uh, we can do like this with your permission. And now I would like just to thank all our panelists for their very valuable and interesting contribution for the counter-trafficking course. So thank Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>